Great to have you both here with me this morning. And let's just um, jump into it. As I said, we want to start with some, some more basic stuff. I, I don't know, how many of you have, have been collecting for a long time? <coughs> Raise your hands. And how many of you are new collectors or are thinking that uh, you want to start collecting soon? Okay, good, good. Um, so, um, first of all, Claire, why don't you, um, I don't know how many of you know exactly what a registrar does, so why don't you explain to, to our audience what it is that you do and what you're responsible for? Sure. So, uh, a registrar is responsible for tracking the location, movement, and condition of objects in a collection or exhibition, and that's primarily done through paperwork, uh, old style, and uh, also through digital um, means via collection management, photography, and uh, other kinds of communications. Um, my work with the Rockefeller collection here involves, uh, or with the permanent collection here, it involves arranging for insurance, arranging for packing, um, arranging for conservation. Pretty much anything that has to do with the physical object is part of what falls under registrar's responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And of course, when, when we acquire objects, um, together we work to um, make sure that, that those are uh, appropriate on, in every possible way for, for the collection. Indeed, yeah. Um, so so if, you're, um, if you are buying a work, um, you should already be asking yourself, um, whether or not you're thinking that it's going to um, stay with, with you and your family, or maybe it might have a future uh, where you sell it or give it to another collection. Um, as, as, as you're considering it, these are things that should be coming through your mind. Um, you know, if I am thinking about giving it to, my descent, to a descendant, um, um, will, will they or will I... Um, want to possibly resell it through a dealer or an auction house. Um, these, are, these are questions that should also be in your mind. Um, and then if, if indeed these are things that you're thinking of doing, then there are things that you can do to assure that in the future you're going to be able to carry out these actions with, with greater confidence and, and ease um, and make um, others around you um, much happier. <laughs> um, so, um, so Claire, uh, I'm s say I'm someone who's purchasing a new or old work of art from an artist or a collector or a dealer or an auction house. Um, let's talk about what I can do to protect my investment. Sure. So um, with any investment, you want to make sure that you've done your research and you may want to work with an advisor to make sure that you're, you're making good choices where, where you're investing your money. Um, the, one of the key things from my particular point of view is to make sure you have your paperwork in order. Uh, some of the things that you should absolutely have as part of your files permanent, um, I mean, as part of your object's permanent file are original documents. Uh, if you're buying from an auction house, make sure you keep a copy of the auction catalog. Um, if, uh, once you've actually made the purchase, make sure your invoice has all the uh, pertinent information of where it's purchased. It has your information on it as well, your address and your name. It has all the details about the object that you possibly could have, title, artist, date, dimensions, medium. Uh, if you don't have a title, if it's an uh, older object, try not to have it just say vase. Have it say green, you know, conical shaped vase and try to have dimensions. All these things help to readily identify that this is actually the object that you purchased. Um, um, so um, I just wanted to add one thing, um, it, and it's not as much for resale purposes, it's just practical purposes in case of theft or something like mm -hmm. that. It's always good to have a good photograph, and if it's a vase of more than one side of the photograph, it's amazing how many people who when a work is stolen or missing don't have any photographs or only a, ra a rather bad photograph. So it's not a bad idea uh, to keep that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Um, suppose the object is being shipped to me either nationally or internationally. Is <clears throat> any of that paperwork something I should be Sure. Keeping? The shipping information is very important because if it's entering the country from uh, another international location, you may need things such as uh, import license or export license from the, com the uh, country that's coming from. If the object has any natural materials, any organic materials, you may need a CITES license. For example, something like ivory, tortoise shell, uh, certain kinds of wood are also protected under the CITES uh, uh, laws, regulations. regulations so, um, and and in terms of the paperwork, what what form do you recommend keeping it in? Uh, you should absolutely keep originals if you can, uh, but you can also. Uh, scan them and have them saved electronically. And if you do save them electronically, if you have a file service through, um, through the cloud, this is actually a really kind of the best way to preserve your scans. The, in most cloud services, uh, you end up with, there's a redundancy built into the system. So if there's a breakdown, um, say if your computer crashed, uh, and that was the only place you had your electronic files, then you've lost them for good. Mm -hmm. But if you're, in a, if you're saving them in the cloud, there's redundancy systems where if there's an incident, it actually is saved on other servers. So um, it's something to invest in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I also think that, uh, you know, there's, if, you, if you keep all of this material, um, and if you're, you're, the work of art that you're purchased is indeed a great work of art, um, uh, or a very strong work of art, having all of this documentation down the road um, can be very helpful to you, um, as I had mentioned, if you want to sell it. But, but actually, it can, especially with an important work of art, it can make it that much more desirable to the auction house, to the dealer, um, to the buyer. Um, so there's no guarantee that this is the case, but sometimes it can actually increase the value of the work that you're, you're buying because you actually have that documentation with you as opposed to, I mean, I think that, that often if you look at a catalog, you know, they'll, talk, you know, they'll mention all the provenance. So, um, so having this kind of documentation, the more documentation, in fact, that you have, the happier mm -hmm. that your registrar, the registrar at the museum is going to be the happier that the dealer is going to be, who, be who's helping you sell it or the auction house. Um, so um, we really do recommend keeping this information and, and really try to keep it for your own sake. Try to keep, you know, keep an individual file for each piece of work that you buy because in the future you're going to drive yourself crazy digging through boxes trying to put everything back together sure. otherwise. Um, is there anything else that I haven't hit that either of you want to mention? Not necessarily. I mean, I'm going to say some of this okay. and, and uh, in fact, one could do a 20-hour program on this as well. So. Okay. So then I'm going to let, Sharon, I'm going to let you go into some of the more complex issues now that are fe facing those up, of us up, yeah, up at the podium. Up, 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 up at the sure. podium. So first, I want to thank you all for coming on a very, very cold and, um, uh, Sunday morning and letting me, me share some of uh, Asia Week uh, uh, with you all um, and, uh, and just sort of uh, tell you that uh, provenance and due diligence, which are words that are really coming up this, today in this, in this program, are buzzwords uh, today, uh, but long before they became household words. Um, IFAR, um, my organization, or the organization I've been privileged to head, uh, was focused on them. And in April 2000, for example, uh, 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 we organized a major conference uh, on this subject uh, and then published the proceedings in a double issue of the IFAR journal. In the bottom line of that program and the organization and this program and other ones like this are that no one wants to end up on the front pages of the New York Times in an unfavorable light. Um, and as hasn't been discussed, but as we all know, uh, there are several seizures and legal cases pertaining to Asian art that have made headlines uh, recently and may be making some of 
some collectors and maybe even some of you uh, a little nervous. But um, concerns aren't only limited to Asian art. There are, of course, Holocaust-era art restitution issues, regular uh, uh, theft issues, um, and fakes and forgeries as well, which really are in some respects related because a lot of the things that are brought in illicitly happen to end up being fakes as well. But there are also fakes in the more modern, uh, in the more modern market. And I needn't remind you all of the uh, Nodla Gallery fake scandal, uh, which brought down that one's uh, venerable establishment. Uh, I personally testified at the, uh, as a fact witness at that trial last year and concocted provenance uh, and a trusted gallery were key factors in that case. And maybe that sounds a little familiar to uh, some of you. So really, what is a collector uh, to do, uh, and by collector, it's also museums as well. Museums are collectors in, in, in this sense of the word, and what resources are available. So in the very brief time that I have, um, I'm going to try to provide first some overview of the relevant uh, issues and legal landscape, and then tell you about some online resources that we at IFAR uh, have available f for you to make you, if you will, better educated and more th ethical. We shouldn't forget the ethical um, um, art collectors and or professionals. So some things uh, worth keeping in mind, uh, really pretty obvious and basic. Uh, for one, collecting standards have really changed. Uh, that's all there is to it. And this is particularly true regarding antiquities, but it's true regarding all the other things as well. Uh, I mentioned earlier Holocaust era art restitution issues, which um, weren't on people's minds 25 years ago and aren't on everyone's mind um, uh, now. Um, what must, what must, once might have been acceptable no longer is. And it's especially true for antiquities and other works brought in from foreign countries. Um, another thing, oh, excuse me. Uh, another thing is that red flags should be investigated. Don't ignore them. The law doesn't look kindly on people who turn a blind eye to works that are too inexpensive, have no exhibition and ownership history, have little or no documentation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They may, in fact, be perfectly legitimate works to get, but it's certainly worth investigating and asking questions. Provenance, which I, a word I, that's already come up, which means literally a works ownership history, but people tend to define it even more broadly, exhibition history, documentation history, and whatever, but it's really the ownership history, is extremely important both for ascertaining legality of ownership and also for authenticity. I'm going to return to that in a few minutes. Uh, uh, another point. The U.S. is one of the very few countries that doesn't have strict ownership and export laws pertaining to cultural objects. For this reason, many Americans have a hard time accepting the fact that most other countries do, okay? Um, and that if a foreign country has a clear and valid ownership law vesting ownership of antiquities, for example, in the state, and such um, an object is removed from the country illicitly and brought into the United States, our courts might very well consider that work stolen just as if it were taken from an individual or a museum or some other um, known uh, uh, place. Um, So-called patrimony laws, by the way, are not limited only to antiquities, but they uh, particularly pertain to antiquities. Also, the U.S. has agreements with many countries. There are, for example, currently 16 bilateral agreements under the Cultural Property Implementation Act alone, which restrict importation into our country of certain types of, quote, at-risk objects. You should become familiar with these agreements. And finally, or at least finally from this very abbreviated list, and to paraphrase our former president, Ronald Reagan, trust but verify. There's no reason not to have trust and faith in a dealer who tells you an object is authentic or legal to acquire. But it certainly can't hurt to ask a lot of questions and do your own double checking as well. 
So the legal landscape um, governing this area is much too complicated to cover in just a few minutes. But in a nutshell, there are federal laws, and this includes um, customs laws and, uh, wired, uh, and mail, tra uh, mail fraud laws, and most notably theft laws, which include uh, most prominently the uh, National Stolen Property Act, which governs the transport of stolen objects across state and U.S. boundaries. As I said before, if a foreign government, quote, owns a particular object through a valid cultural heritage law, the National Stolen Property Act can kick in and has kicked in in several uh, legal cases. There are also state laws. Here in New York in particular, uh, the, the law is important because it factors into uh, so, some of the recent cases that have made the news, such as the case against the dealer Subhash Kapoor, who is currently awaiting trial in India. Be oh, excuse me. Um, so it factored into the case against Subhash Kapoor and also uh, in the charges against, uh, in the complaint that was filed in December by uh, uh, authorities against uh, dealer um, uh, Nancy Weiner. Um, uh, it, it was actually state law and not federal law that was used because New York state law has an advantage. There's a presumption of knowledge uh, when it concerns an art dealer. Um, that's a very important distinction. There are also international conventions, most notably, uh, you hear about this all the time, the 1970 UNESCO Convention, whose full name actually says it all. It's the Convention on the Means of Prohibiting and Preventing the Illicit Import, Export, and Transfer of Ownership of Cultural Property. So it's a 1970 law, um, and essentially this is an agreement to which the U.S. became a party uh, in 1983, um, which honors uh, another country's uh, export, ownership, and whatever uh, laws, so long as they are also a party to the convention. And currently there are approximately 115 countries that are parties to it, so it affects a lot of countries. We actually didn't accept the entire uh, UNESCO convention, but it's a little more complicated, so we accepted it with reservations and with certain procedures that have to uh, be put in place, uh, which uh, are connected to these bilateral agreements that I referred to earlier. The convention's date of 1970, even though we didn't sign on until 1983, is often used as a bright, bright line, uh, uh, excuse me, we didn't become a party until 1983. We actually signed it much earlier. Uh, um, it's actually a bright line date before which it's more or less okay for a work or antiquity to have entered the United States and be marketed and acquired, and after which it's not absent strong evidence to the contrary. But in fact, that's a little simplistic, although I don't have time to go into it now. But the 1970 date is the date you will almost always see um, uh, as the cautionary date for which different kinds of documentation and everything else uh, are asked. Uh, there are also foreign ownership laws, which I've already referred to and which I'm going to return to in a minute when I go on to our website. The bilateral agreements, which I've already referred to. And then let's not forget professional guidelines. Organizations such as the American Alliance of Museums, AAM, the Association of Art Museum Directors, various dealer groups, archaeological groups, uh, and so on, have professional standards and guidelines. By the way, they're all posted on our website as well. Uh, they've become increasingly stringent, stringent, excuse me, although they don't have the force of law. Um, so, um, all of this information um, is available on uh, IFAR's uh, website, which I'm now going to uh, uh, connect to um, and show you our homepage so we can get rid of the slides now. Yeah, I'm just going to put this here. Thank you. Um, so, if you go on to our homepage, this upper left hand corner here uh, uh, has a section called educational. Uh, resources, um, and um, uh, let's just start with a provenance guide that we have. Um, I've already mentioned the word provenance. Uh, it's extremely important. Uh, it's something 
most people associate <laughs> or historically associated with authenticity, but it's increasingly important now now to be proving legality of ownership uh, on a work. Um, this section is essentially a primer to provenance research that we've had up for quite a while. It's already very extensive, but I'm very pleased to announce that we have completely expanded and revised it, and within a few days we'll be posting this uh, uh, greatly expanded uh, provenance research uh, guide. Um, uh, it's very hard to keep up with this field. There are so many other resources that are coming into play which we're trying to link to. We also have a very brief um, but nonetheless, it's compact but useful collector's corner uh, with practical information. And then something very important, an esoteric word, but not really, catalogs raisin A, we use the French word in English, which are, as many of you I'm sure know, uh, 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 scholarly compilations of an entire, uh, an artist's entire body of work or body of work in a particular medium, such as painting uh, or sculpture. This is an extraordinary and very unique resource that IFAR has. There frankly is no other like it that I know of in the entire world. Uh, um, uh, catalogs raisonnés are really essential tools uh, for doing uh, research in authenticity and provenance. Our database contains bibliographic, this is an integrated bibliographic database. Um, it currently contains information on more than 3,800 published, published volumes of catalogs raisonné concerning almost 2,700 artists and also has information on currently 345 catalogs raisonné in preparation, which you will not find any place else. This information is based on a questionnaire, a multi-page questionnaire that we send out and we complete. Um, and um, unfortunately, only a small number of those artists and publications concern Asian artists, currently a little over 1% in fact, and this is a database that can be searched, I, I don't have time to really go into the database, but can be searched um, by artist, by author, by period, um, and also by country. So if, for example, you go into um, let me pull it, China, um, you can get a list of currently 11 artists, Chinese artists that are on. Um, we have 16 Japanese artists. This is very small when you compare it to what I told you was almost 2,700 artists. Uh, we know there must be more catalogs raisonné out there on Asian artists, so if any of you know of either catalogs raisonné, and we mean real catalogs raisonné, not monographs, not exhibition catalogs, catalogs raisonné which attempt to do what I said, um, uh, uh, compile an artist's entire body of work with information about it, then please do let us know. There's a, a way on the website that tells you how you can let us know about these catalogs. We'd like to add um, uh, more, uh, strengthen the Asian artist category. Of course, this is not very helpful for antiquities for all the obvious reasons, but it's for much more modern artists. And um, fakes and forgeries, by the way, and uh, are not limited only to Western artists. Korea is having a very big issue about it. I participated in a major conference they had last year on this very subject. They're, uh, they're very concerned about uh, the fakes in Korean art, and we know already um, in China. So this is not just just limited to, uh, to Western art. But now to move to the section of our site that's, I think, most germane to the subject uh, today, which is our art law and cultural property database. Uh, I'm, sh I'm showing you here the entry page. Uh, so, excuse me. Um, so this was created initially with the help of an IMLS uh, a grant that's a federal agency. It was a national leadership grant which called this project, quote, invaluable for museums and others who need help um, uh, uh, navigating the mushrooming thicket, and it really is mushrooming, uh, and very hard to find, um, a thicket of um, international legislation and case law, primarily U.S. case law, concerning the legality of ownership and transfer and, to a lesser extent, authenticity of art objects. We launched it in December 2008. And like our catalog raisonné database, it's an interactive, living resource continuously updated and expanded. It is very, 
difficult to keep up. We write to countries every single year. I think we, we contacted 180 last year. But it's very, very hard to get this um, uh, information. And like all the resources on IFAR's website, uh, the Art Law Database was initially free. The others still are. But it's been so costly for us to maintain and an effort to sustain it uh, long term. We recently added a mod modest annual subscription fee, and it really is modest uh, and doesn't cover fully our cost. Um, but two to four hour acts, two and four hour access is also available. Um, uh, and our donors at a certain level uh, uh, get. Uh, free access. Um, the database gathers in one place, I'm showing you a map, international cultural property legislation from currently 121 um, uh, countries with more being added. And if you click on, um, it's defaulted to Europe here, if you click on Asia, you'll see that we have information about 22 countries uh, in Asia, and that doesn't count the Middle East. The Middle East is its own section. Um, so that's quite um, um, uh, quite a lot. Um, the uh, country legislative documents, and I'll just click on, I'll end up showing you one or two countries. Um, the, uh, oh, it's making me sign in again. Okay. I hope it works. It worked a minute ago. Hmm. Okay, so you keep getting this pop-up, which is our terms and conditions, because it reminds you we are not giving legal advice. <laughs> We're not a law organization. This is an educational resource. So if you go on to China, every place you see a blue link is a link to another document or another site or, or something. Uh, so each of the countries, and they're organized all very similarly. Some we have more legislation for, some we have um, uh, less, depending on what we were able to get. Uh, all the legislation is, to the best of our ability, put up in both the original language and in English translations that, for the most part, we've paid to translate. They are not, therefore, they are not official translations, uh, meaning you can't use them in a court of law, but this is an educational um, resource in any case. Um, and it also contains um, cultural property contact information, the person you can contact in a country if you have a particular question about legality. I say this with a caveat because as much as we try to keep up to date, uh, these uh, um, um, people and, and, and officials in the countries turn over very, very fast. And uh, we can never fully promise that these are the most accurate or up to date. And again, if anyone knows that something is incorrect, we really would like to be notified um, of this. Um, uh, all the information is from these different legislative documents is culled under certain rubrics that are consistent from country to country, regulated cultural property, um, export restrictions, ownership rights and restrictions, violations and penalties, uh, what uh, treaties the country belongs to. So you can see China uh, uh, joined the UNESCO Convention in uh, 1990. Uh, bilateral agreements. There is a bilateral agreement between China and the U.S. under uh, uh, this Cultural Property Implementation Act. It was rather controversial when it was initially uh, enacted in um, uh, 2009. You can see the date there. Um, it was. These are five-year agreements. It was renewed and amended. It was actually extended in 2014. And so it's in place for another five years from 2014. Um, and then at the bottom, we put some other information as we have it, including if we know the effect of current legislation on prior legislation, did it supersede? We keep the prior legislation, the old legislation, up on the website because sometimes um, uh, what's important to you as a collector or to a museum is what law was in in place at the time the work was acquired and not what is the current law. So we have tried where we can. It's very difficult sometimes to get hold of the older laws. And mind you, this is for 121 countries. Um, uh, uh, so each one of these that you click on uh, uh, links you to the full text of a document. 
Um, also, we have where, where it's relevant, and if there's a United States legal case that in some way had to do with that particular country, in this case China, you, you see it down on the lower right, and you can actually click, and you actually get to a different section of our website, which is the case law uh, uh, and statute section, which is, as I said earlier, primarily U.S. cases, although there are some foreign cases as well. Case law in the U.S. is particularly important, not only because we're gearing this m more towards an American audience, but also because case law in the U.S. is, uh, um, our legal system is, um, 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 is based on precedent, legal precedent. So you do want to know what cases uh, are in effect. And this particular case is one that we actually happen to have in, in one of the journals on display, um, um, a case that you may recognize from the image that's here. And one of the things that's very unique about our database is uh, we have the images of the artworks that were at issue in the particular cases. Even LexisNexis and Westlaw don't don't have this. And many of these images, especially for older cases, come from our our files we've been publishing since the 1970s uh, and our own research. Um, so uh, in, I'm not going to go through this uh, particular case. Some of you may remember this case when the work was um, uh, seized uh, when it came up for auction um, uh, at Christie's. And this, by the way, was not under a patrimony law. Um, and uh, it was really under the Cultural Property Implementation Act because this was a documented work that had been taken from a known site um, uh, in China. I just wanted to take you into Cambodia and show you um, another uh, country on the database that's uh, uh, an uh, Asian, another Asian country, uh, Cambodia, where we don't have as many laws as we do for China. Uh, and by the way, it's a little deceptive because we're forced by the system to have a different line for the English translation and for the original language. Uh, we often repeat the title of a, a law twice because of the need to have a link separately to each of those documents. And I wanted to draw your attention to the fact that in Cambodia, we have laws that go back as early as 1900, 1925. The, uh, these are old laws from when Cambodia wasn't Cambodia, it was part of French uh, Indochina. And um, these particular laws have been mentioned in some of the recent legal cases. In fact, it was mentioned in the uh, New York uh, complaint against uh, Nancy Weiner. Uh, it's not really clear whether these laws would hold up in a U.S. court as a valid ownership law. Uh, in most cases don't come fully to trial. This law was also mentioned in the case um, uh, against, and I'll show you the link to it that I'm sure you all remember, from very recent case um, um, for the, uh, uh, the 10th century sculpture that turned up for auction at Subbies. Um, ultimately, there was a settlement and that sculpture was excuse me, was returned to Cambodia, where it's now part of an entire complex that has been reunited with many sculptures that have been returned in, in, in voluntarily uh, from museums in the United States. It's really very moving, actually, uh, in context of, of uh, Cambodia to see these works here. But the old, that old, those old laws were mentioned in the legal documents. And as I said, it's just not clear uh, which laws will hold up in a U.S. court of law if something fully comes to trial as a valid ownership document, as opposed to, in some recent laws, not all laws are ownership laws, some are export laws, uh, which are different. They also will be, uh, um, can be seized and forfeited in the United States, particularly under our, a very strong customs law um, uh, that we have, 1595A. Um, but um, in terms of an ownership law and the National Stolen Property Act, it really does have to be a valid ownership law. Um, so uh, many countries are enacting these laws or strengthening, amending and strengthening their existing laws so that they would hold up. I don't know that they're doing them specifically for an American court, but that they're, uh, but they are, uh, uh, they, they are, uh, um, uh, strengthening these laws, and it's one of the reasons why it's very hard to keep up 
uh, with them. And again, if you look at Cambodia, you can see the, the sections that we have on the summaries are really very much the same. So um, in, I mentioned we also have uh, the case law section. I don't have time to go into it, but uh, we have hundreds, summaries of hundreds of US cases with the legal citation, the summaries, what happened in court, uh, and the images. We also have up here a section on professional guidelines. Again, each one of these blue links uh, um, uh, attaches to a document for that professional organization. Um, uh, we have a legal glossary, and many of most of the cases have legal words that are also highlighted uh, in it. Um, and I, I obviously I could spend hours on this, but you get the drift of the uh, complexity of both the laws and the enormity of this uh, database. Although some of the information we have on the database uh, can be found on other sites, and another particularly good site that, for the laws at least, is the UNESCO Cultural Heritage Site. But it's much, much more difficult uh, uh, to navigate and very, very differently organized without the summaries um, of the country summaries and without any of the case law summaries. Um, uh, we made a special effort to make ours very easily navigable, even to lay people who would want to use it and to make it more comprehensive. Um, maybe some of you in the room, I hope, uh, have already been using this site uh, or will decide to use this or some of the other resources uh, that are very freely available and tell others about them. Of course, I hope some of you will choose to subscribe. Um, and better yet, may, if you think we're doing good work, um, uh, even choose to support us uh, because uh, we are not an endowed foundation. We are a nonprofit organization, and we really do a lot of good work for the field and could use the support. Uh, but that's the end of that plug. <laughs> um, but in conclusion, um, don't be afraid of collecting, but do collect ethically, legally, and wisely. Be cautious and make use of the resources that we and other people have made available for you. Thank you.